That air is bad. Okay, so I'm going to talk about information technology in the developing world, which is basically what I do. What? Louder? How's that? Better? Louder when you turn it on. I think it's on. Okay, so I'm going to talk about information technology in the developing world, and I cannot get the microphone any closer to my mouth, so you're just going to have to listen. Um, so basically what I do is I travel around to countries that are really low on that graph that you saw a little bit earlier, uh, that have really very lousy internet connections. So that was Cambodia that you were just looking at. That was a provincial capital, so that was basically the equivalent of, say, Pike Street uh, through the capital in the state. And that's um, a nice little uh, street in uh, Uzbekistan, and uh, that would be sort of the equivalent of if you were by Green Lake and you were walking down to the park, that's kind of what you would see. Uh, so that's Kenya and that's pretty much um, like a rest stop off of I-5. And so what I do is I travel around and I look at how people use stuff, the kind of stuff that we use every day but in really radically different contexts and what they do with it. And so the next is, uh, so that's basically Safeway um, in uh, Tajikistan. But there's no, uh, no club carts and it's not open 24 hours a day. So one of the things that is really interesting when you travel around is that people do actually use the same stuff that we do, but they use it in really different ways. So this is an internet cafe, and in most of these countries, people predominantly gain access to the internet in public places like this. And so what you see is people sitting really close together, and those are really ancient computers, and that picture was actually taken about, actually about a year ago, I guess, not so long ago. And what you also often see is that people cluster together like that, and so you'll have multiple people sharing a computer, and you'll have people sitting really close to each other so they can basically see what each other is doing. And you would think that that would cut down on porn consumption, but it actually doesn't. <laughs> So, uh, and then you also have uh, just general surveillance, and these are countries where there's um, a, a significant amount of risk associated with if you do what's known as inappropriate things, but of course no one ever actually tells you what's inappropriate, and so both ISP is monitoring, and then also the people who own the cafe are gonna be checking out what you're doing, because if you do a bad thing, then they're gonna get a visit from the secret police, and they don't really want that to happen. And so that's um, an internet place. Uh, this is in Cambodia as well, and there's a nice little cat that lives in that cafe because the rats come in and they chew on the papers and the wires so the cat's job is to keep away the rats and this is a place where the internet actually goes down on a regular basis when the rain comes so it's a weather dependent technology um, so that says internet cafe revolt and oftentimes people like to think that the internet brings some sort of political activism and it allows people to resist their totalitarian governments um, but often what we see is that when people get access to them what they do is they're playing a lot of games and they are incredibly ingenious in what they do. This is uh, Tajikistan. This is actually a really nice outfit in Tajikistan um, where you can make photocopies and use VoIP and do all kinds of great things. So you can also um, play some Counter-Strike as you get your bread uh, down on the main street. <laughs> and one of the really interesting things that people have done is they've set up these uh, uh, basically citywide land so they can do things like play World of Warcraft when they can't afford to use the internet or the speed is too slow. But if you've ever played World of Warcraft, if you can imagine what it's like to be in uh, on a server where there's maybe only 150 people playing, it's kind of lonely because they're you know it's a big world and there just aren't that many people online. And so uh, there's a lot of StarCraft and Warcraft going on as well. Uh, kids um, in the, living in these giant Soviet flats, what they'll do is they'll cable together uh, the apartment buildings up and down in these 18-story or 12-story buildings so that they can play Counter-Strike with their friends using the illegal cabling. <coughs> And one of the reasons they play so many games is games cost one sum. Being online also costs one sum, and the internet costs two and a half sum. And um, the distinction between online and internet is uh, a great question, and that's one of the things you can ask me later. So one of the other things that we found, and I'm, a, I'm an academic, so basically uh, we re move very slowly, so I'm going to give you six years of research in five minutes. So the telecom infrastructure kind of looks like this. And then um, if you're really lucky, you will come to uh, a place where it looks like that if you want to make a phone call. So what happens is it's all about mobile phones. So it's mobiles, mobiles, mobiles. And that's pretty much what people depend on. So tons of internet telephone, tons of VoIP, um, which is illegal in some countries. Uh, in some countries they can advertise it on the street. In other places they can't. And so the telephony, the, what the internet has done for telephony has really transformed how people talk. And so mobiles have become just an incredible accessory and they have become a technology that people
totally dependent on in terms of their everyday life because, as you saw, the public uh, telecom infrastructure pretty much sucks and the domestic, what you have in your home, is um, not really much better. Uh, so you can see people of all generations buying their mobile accessories and uh, this is one of the things that sort of over the course of five years we've seen so the internet came to the region in the late 90s mobile phones came in like 2003 you could really get mobile service and already the mobile rate uh, the mobile usage rate is twice what the internet is and so in a country like Tajikistan which has just come out of a civil war has about five million people one of the poorest countries they have what do we have seven GSM uh, mobile companies and they have another two or three CDMA companies and it's incredible how it's taken off. They've been really smart in how they've uh, figured out specific markets. So one of those mobile companies that you see up there, for example, operates uh, in a very small area only on the border with Afghanistan. If you can imagine what people are using that mobile uh, network for, the transport of a very particular substance, poppies. Uh, and this is from Kenya where also the whole mobile thing has allowed people to, well basically it takes about three years to two to three years and a pretty substantial bribe to get a home phone and so the international calling is what people are completely dependent on and all of the satellite, all of the internet connectivity in the country is through satellite and it's hideously expensive so this is really what they rely on. All right.